dealing with life issues. Uh, apparently, he, owned, he owes thousands of dollars in child support. That's, yeah, that's insane. All right, uh, so he's dealing with that. All right, so remember last class we were talking about two-phase locking, and uh, we were sort of referring to, you know, when we talked about running the two-phase locking protocol, we would acquire these shared locks and, and exclusive locks on, on database objects, and I didn't necessarily specify what those objects were. Um, so with, if we just assume that it's tuples, then there's going to be a bunch of problems that, that are going to occur because, well, it's, it's going to have this high performance overhead because if we now need to update a billion tuples, we have to go acquire one billion locks. And that would be really expensive for us to keep going back into this lock manager one, uh, you know, over and over again, acquiring, you know, acquiring these locks. Um, it's caused problems. So what we can do now is we can actually have this notion of a hierarchy uh, in our database where we have higher level objects that have a larger scope or purview uh, of, of the things below it. And now we can acquire locks at the higher level objects. And implicitly, that acquires locks to, to the things below it. And the goal for us here is that we want the database system to acquire, ideally, the fewest number of locks we need for that transaction to run uh, correctly, and we want to you know, possibly do it in a way that has the, you know, the, the lowest overhead of going into you know, the lock manager over again. So I showed this diagram before, right? So we're going to organize the database system at a logical level into this hierarchy, uh, where you have a database, a database has tables, tables has pages, pages has tuples, and, and tuples can have attributes inside of them. So now when my transaction comes along, T1 here, uh, I can get a lock on the, the table. I'm not saying whether it's shared or exclusive at this point. And that implicitly acquires all the locks below it. Now, every other transaction is going to have to come in and go through the same hierarchy, right? So you can't have a transaction show up in here and just grab tuple locks. The protocol, the way the protocol works, everyone sort of starts from the, the top and goes down. Yes? So his statement is, uh, his statement is, when I, my example here, if I acquire the lock on the table, I don't know whether somebody already holds the lock on the tuple, and I'm implicitly acquiring this lock. Yeah, so maybe I, I, should, I should really should show T1 has to start, everyone has to start at the database and go down. Not every system supports locks at the database. At the very least, you start at the table and go down. So everyone goes to, this, to follow the same protocol. No one could come, come down here and, and do stuff without going to the top. Uh, your question is, do, do I assume that the previous transaction already holds a lock on the table? Because like, if this transaction wants to only lock the tuple, right, it goes to the database, go down to the tuple, and then lock it. And then the second transaction comes in, and then it goes to the table and okay. lock that. Okay, I understand what he's saying. So, yeah, th th this is, th maybe this, this, this example is overly simplified. So his statement is, I show T1 here, he they, you know, he, this one acquires the lock on the table, and implicitly that gets everyone else. But if another transaction shows up, can they not lock anything on the way down and just get the locks at the bottom? No. This is what the intention locks will handle for us. They, everyone has to acquire a lock at the levels as you go down. Oh. So, and I showed this last time briefly, but I'll just say it again, that like, not every system is going to support this hierarchy uh, if they support two-phase locking. Uh, at the very least, they're going to support tuple-level locks. Then they're probably going to also maybe support table locks. Uh, database, database locks, as I said, are rare. Page locks are common, but not ubiquitous. Postgres doesn't support page locks. MySQL does. Other systems do. And then the attribute locks, those are super rare as well, because that's, that's really fine grain. That's like saying, within one tuple, I want to acquire a lock on a single attribute. And again, the only system I know that does this uh, is, is Yugabyte. There might be, an, might be others out there. I, I just don't know. All right? But again, the idea is everyone has to follow the same protocol. You go from the top, acquire locks on the way down. So maybe, yeah, so the mistake is I should show Someone's acquiring, you have to acquire a lock on, on the database. All right, so to answer his question is, all right, how, you know, how, you know, if everyone has to acquire locks on the way down, but maybe I don't want to get a shared lock on the entire table, I just want a shared lock on a single tuple, how, how, do, I actually, how do I actually do this? And this is what intention locks are going to help us do, right? The intention locks are basically going to be hints at the higher, higher level parts of this hierarchy that we can, give, tell other transactions that down below, here's what's happening. 
that our intention is to acquire an exclusive lock or a shared lock at some lower point in, in the tree, right? Uh, and then this, this other, other transactions that show up can, if they try to acquire maybe an exclusive lock on the entire, uh, on the entire table, we would know someone down below has a shared lock on something, and therefore we, we, wouldn't be, wouldn't, we, we wouldn't be allowed to do that. And we can figure this out without having to go to the bottom of the hierarchy and, and look at everything. So there's three types of attention locks, attention shared, attention exclusive, and attention sh or shared attention exclusive. So attention shared just says that there's up a, below me at some, in the tree, in the hierarchy, there's a transaction that has an explicit lock on some object in, in shared mode, right? Uh, so that as you're, as, if your new transaction is showing up, you're telling everyone else, I have intention to acquire a shared lock down below. So don't do something that, that would be incompatible with me. Attention exclusive is the same thing. It's my, it's, I'm saying that at some lower point in the tree or the hierarchy, I'm getting something with an exclusive lock. And again, that warns other people from, from doing something that, 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 would, that would conflict. And then shared attention exclusive is basically trying to do a share lock and attention exclusive at the same time. So you're saying that I'm taking a share lock at that, at that point of the tree, at that node, everything below it, but then somewhere down below also too, I'm taking a, an exclusive lock on something. So we can expand our compatibility matrix now, and this looks like the, some of the screenshots. Yes, question. When you log the node and share node, is it equivalent to logging the whole subtree? His question is, if I lock something in shared mode, uh, is that equivalent to locking everything below the subtree? Yes. Uh, with, with shared intention exclusive or shared mode? Shared, shared uh, intention exclusive. Yeah, so I, I get I, the, at that node, everything below is in shared mode, and then somewhere is an exclusive mode. Or doesn't that mean you lock the nodes down below with shared and then exclusive? So they are not uh, the statement is, does this mean I'm acquiring on a single node something in shared mode and exclusive mode? They're not compatible. If you're the transaction that's doing, doing the locking, then it's compatible with you. Yeah, but that's only compatible within a single transaction. It's only compatible within a single transaction, yes. Oh. Yeah. Okay. It's, it's basically, it's, it's a lock upgrade, right? We talked this before. Like, I, if, I hold a, if I hold a shared lock on, a, on, on something in regular TPL, ignoring the hierarchy, you okay? All right. Yeah. Uh, if, I hold, if I hold a shared lock on something, uh, and then I, after I do a read, then I want to go back and do a write. I can go back and say, upgrade my lock to, yeah. to, to a write. I can't downgrade, because if I downgrade, then that's triggering the shrinking phase. Uh -huh. okay. Yes? Um, why would you need a shared intention exclusive? Like, you can't just specify intention exclusive. The statement is, why would you need shared intention exclusive? Uh, what's the difference between IX and SIX? Between IX and SIX? Because, uh, well, if you go back here. There are some cases where uh, you know, IX is, com is actually compatible with IS and IX, where shared attention exclusive is only compatible with attention shared. So intention exclusive says, somewhere down below me in the tree, I'm going to take a, an exclusive lock. I don't know where yet. You don't know where yet, right? So someone else can come along and say, okay, well, I'm going to take an attention shared. I'm going to read something. And it may not be the thing that you're reading, right? And at that level in the tree, that's okay. Now, down below in the hierarchy, if you try to take a shared lock, the thing I have an exclusive lock for, then the two-phase locking stuff you know, ticks in just like before. You have to wait. Yes? His statement is, and he's correct, that an intention lock just says that I, it's, it's, that, it's, a, it's a hint to say, I'm going to require a lock in this mode in the future on something down below, but it may not actually have happened yet. Correct, yes. Get in, it's two-phase locking. So it's like, as I'm going down the hierarchy, it may get to the point where like, okay, well, I, I'm at the, I'm trying, I'm trying to acquire a shared lock on the, on the tuple. I can do attention shared up above, that's fine. Then I get to the tuple I actually want, and aha, uh -huh, someone holds the exclusive lock on that, uh, and, then, and, then, and then I have to wait. Yes? Um, so we can acquire shared locks on the same node. We can acquire intention exclusive. Why can't, we, why can't Q1 and Q2 both acquire shared SIX on, on both together acquire SIX? 
This question is why can't T1 and T2, in my, example, in my matrix here, why can't they both be shared intention exclusive? Because you don't know, you don't know at this point when you take the intention locks of what, like, are, you, are we writing the same thing? We don't know. All right, so let, let's go through some examples and we'll see how this makes more sense. And again, the, the idea is that you want to acquire the, the, sort of the, the minimum lock you need at the highest point in the tree. Uh, and then as you get closer to the bottom, whatever the hierarchy is, then you get the, then you get the explicit lock. So you can take intention locks as far as you can down, then at the, at the leaf nodes in the hierarchy, then you want, you want to acquire the, the exact shared or the exact uh, explicit shared or explicit uh, uh, exclusive locks, right? And then, so as you go down, this basically means that you need to hold the appropriate lock on the parent. So if you have, you want to get shared or attention shared on, a lock, on something, you need to at least hold attention shared on the parent. You could also hold shared because shared is more powerful than, than attention shared, but that's the basic idea. And the same thing, if you're going to get a exclusive attention exclusive or a shared attention exclusive, you need to hold at least attention exclusive on, on the parent node. All right, so let's, let's not deal with, um, this is all just text and, 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 and a table. Let's look at actual examples and see how it works. All right, so we're gonna get, we have two transactions, T1, T2. Uh, we're gonna get the balance of my, my offshore account uh, in, in, in the database. And at the same time, we're also gonna get uh, Mushu's account balance, or increase his account balance by 1%. So we're gonna wanna get exclusive and shared locks for the, uh, at the, the nodes of the tree, right? Because that's the bottom part where actually the, the data actually is. Well, I should say what the data is. But it's the lowest part in the hierarchy that represents the actual objects that we're modifying. And then we'll use the attention locks for things above it. So, so for simplicity, we're going to assume a two-level hierarchy. As I said before, some systems will actually have uh, page-level page uh, locks in the hierarchy. This is, this is essentially what Postgres does. It's, it's tables and tuples. All right, so T1 shows up. And again, this wants to read my, my account in, in R. All right, so I, I want to read this tuple. So I have to enter the hierarchy, uh, starting with the root, and that's the table, table R. Uh, and so I'm going to get a intention-shared lock at, at the table, because again, that's saying down below somewhere, I'm, I'm going to get a, I'm going to do a shared lock. Then once I allow to acquire that, then I traverse down here into the hierarchy, and I, I can go acquire now a shared lock on, on the tuple. All right, that works. That's fine. So here we want to update Mushu's record, right? So we want to do a write on this tuple here. So I can get a intention exclusive lock on the table. Uh, that's allowed to be compatible with uh, intention shared. And then I get the exclusive lock on the tuple, and then I, I can do my write, and I'm done. All right, let's look at a more complicated example. So now we have three transactions running at the same time. T1 is going to scan all the tuples in R and update just one of them. T2 is going to uh, read a single tuple in R. And then T3 is going to do, uh, scan all the tuples in R. And assume that they're going to arrive in the system in, in, in their, you know, in T1, followed by T2, followed by T3. Right? So they'll, we'll walk through them as they go into the hierarchy, assuming they don't know what's coming in the future. So they, but they know what's, they, they, any transaction that preceded it has already acquired the locks. All right, so. T1 starts, again, wants to scan all tuples in R and update, it, update one of them. All right, so it wants to read everything and then update this last one over here. So here is now where we can use the shared intention exclusive because I want to read everything below me. Uh, and so instead of grabbing the shared lock for every single one of these tuples and then just the exclusive lock of this guy over here, if I do shared intention exclusive, then I implicitly get the shared lock for everybody. And then now I only need to get the exclusive lock for for that one tuple. T2 starts, wants to read a single tuple. So this one here, we do intention shared at the top. That's compatible with this, shared intention exclusive, right? Because there's, there's no write conflicts. Uh, and then when we get down here, we can take the shared lock on, on that tuple. Last guy shows up, he wants to scan all tuples in R. And so we could do the same, we could, we could uh, take attention shared at the top, and then try to do shared, you know, shared locks explicitly for all the ones at the bottom. But again, the database system can recognize that, because it knows what the query is trying to do, because it's, it's SQL, it's declarative. It would know, essentially, how many things you think you're actually going to have to lock. So in this case here, it can decide, OK, well, that's going to be a lot of locks. Uh, 
So let me just take a shared lock on the table entirely. Uh, and that way I don't have to do the individual locking. In this case here, shared lock is not compatible with, with shared intention exclusive because someone could be writing to something down below. So, so the T3 is gonna have to stall and wait in the lock manager. The lock, lock manager will, will prevent this. All right, so then T2 finishes, he commits, he goes away. Uh, so that, that's fine, the, the intention share goes away. And then the, uh, once, once T1 commits, that we, we get rid of the shared intention exclusive, get rid of the exclusive lock. Now T3 can acquire the share lock on the table and then it can complete the scan. Yes, in the back. So we make the decision which lock to acquire before we make any of this decision. Like you said here, we could have gotten the shared lock on every single people. But first we decide to lock the entire table. And then even if we realize it's actually not efficient to do that, because we have to wait. So is it like one step after the other? Yeah, so his question is, um, I said that the database system is going to try to figure out what's the, what's the, the right granularity of the locks you need to acquire. Uh, and in my example here, it, would, it knew that, okay, I'm going to scan all these tuples, so let me get a shared lock at the table, because I don't want to get the individual locks for all the tuples. Uh, it may be the case that the, so the, some data systems will try to figure this out ahead of time. Other times it could have a trigger and say, okay, well, uh, I thought you're going to maybe acquire a small number of locks. Uh, but it looks like you're acquiring a lot more. So rather than this me keep going quite individual locks, let me go back and upgrade your parent node lock, right? And that way I, can, I, I get the shared lock on everything below me or the exclusive lock on everything below me. Right, again, this is what the, the in case of Postgres, because it only has two levels, it's, it's pretty, pretty simplistic. Uh, I don't think they do lock escalation. Um, a, a DB2 can, can do, do these kind of things. Yes? So there's an inherent trade-off between like ability for concurrency Yeah. Yeah. So his statement is, uh, and he's correct. There's a trade-off between the the amount of parallelism you can have versus the uh, by having fine-grained locks versus having to go back to lock manager over again. Absolutely. Yes. So I'm not sure why six and IS locks are compatible because, like, they. Uh, at, at, why? Why shared? Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Why shared attention exclusive SIX is compatible with what? Sorry. Yes. Uh, because when you declare SIX. Yes. But like for like IS, then how, it's like I'm going to do something shared down there. How are you sure that the shared and exclusive doesn't collide? Like what if they both want to access the same piece? That's fine. So his statement is, uh, I have these attention locks up above, uh, and but what if down below in the hierarchy, then I have a conflict because like they try to acquire the lock on the same thing. It's then it's just two phase locking. I can't get the shared lock on the thing you have exclusive lock on, or vice versa, right? Yeah. Uh, so going back here, so your, you, your question is why, why is SIX not compatible with, with what? Sorry? Because someone, is, someone has a, if I have SIX on, on some node and then you try to come and get a S lock, I'm writing to something, but I don't know where it is, right? So you could in theory then say, okay, well, let me take a, well, actually nothing's compatible with, with uh, SIX, but like, it's you basic. You're basically saying like, if I am taking a shared lock on everything. So S lock is the more concrete lock where I the intention lock. That's why IS is more. It's why. Sorry, your statement is. Sorry, yeah, repeat what you said. Sorry. So because when you acquire S, right? Yes. You The statement is like, if you acquire S lock up above, you don't need to acquire uh, individual share locks below. Therefore, that's why the incompatibility happens at the higher level. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. You had a question as well in the back? No? Okay. All right. Yes. Uh, so, on the high level, basically, the introduction of these uh, intention locks is to like, short circuit and prevent you from going to the all the time. Is that the idea? Yes. Yeah, so, his statement is, uh, he's correct. The, the, the purpose of these attention locks is to prevent you from prevent a transaction from acquiring a bunch of locks, uh, only to realize that the thing it needs to do it can't, it can't acquire the lock one. So you try to figure this out sooner rather than later. Yes. Okay. Yes. And there's no sorry. Go ahead. There's no way you can update locks, right? 
Yeah, you can upgrade locks. That's fine. Yeah. But if you upgrade, like, when you can get denied when you try to upgrade, right? Right, you'd have to make sure, like, so if I have, if I have this, I want to upgrade to this. Well, if I have this and somebody else has this, that's okay, but now if I upgrade, and now I would conflict on this, I'd have to block. You have to check if someone else has to share locks. Like, when you, when you upgrade, you have to check to see, like, okay, does this conflict with anybody, any other locks being held at the same time? Yes. The lock, the, again, a lock meter, if the lock meter has this knowledge, yes, because the lock meter has a global view, it sees all the locks. Again, this is different than the latching set. The latching was always embedded in the data structure. There is no global authority to say who holds that latch, because all you're doing is compare and swap. This is, there's additional metadata being stored in the lock meter saying, this transaction holds this lock on this object with, in this mode. Yes. Yes. So in T3, like, it acquires a shared lock because it wants to do a scan on all the tuples. What if you want to scan on, like, half the tuples? Would that, like, be a case for where you just do an intention shared lock? So, so his statement is, uh, my example here, T3, I'm saying it wants to scan all the tuples. What if it wanted to scan the half? What's the threshold? What's, what's the, at what point does it say, okay, don't take the shared lock, take the, take the intention lock, and then take shared lock? It depends on the system, depends on the hardware, depends on the query, depends on so many different things. Yeah. And again, this is where the advanced systems, the, the, the I say advanced, the enterprise systems, the expensive ones, will do things more, have more sophisticated than the, than the open source ones. Is it better in practice? Like, is it, is it just sometimes simple is good? I, it, it, again, it depends. It's a cop-out answer in databases. People say, oh, what about, like, could I do this? What about that? And at the end of the day, it depends on so many different factors. I can't give you like a formula say, this is, all, you always want to do this. Other than always use SQL and almost always use Postgres, I, there's no other, uh, I, I have no other strong edicts to, to impart on you guys. Okay, uh, so any questions about the hierarchical locking? Okay, cool. So let's jump now into today's lecture on timestamp ordering. All right. So again, the, so far we've talked about two-phase locking. Uh, and again, this was trying to generate a uh, serializable ordering of conflicting operations for transactions while they're running. And I said this was a pessimistic approach, meaning we assume that there's going to be conflicts in transactions. So this is, therefore, we're going to require them to acquire the locks before they can do whatever it is that they want to do. And then we can use our two-phase protocol, two-phase locking protocol to decide, you know, is, 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 the, is the transaction allowed to acquire that lock or not? With timestamp ordering, this is going to be an optimistic protocol where we're going to assume transactions aren't going to conflict. So therefore, rather than going through all this, this overhead and maintenance of these locks, for the most part, we'll, we'll allow the transactions to kind of do whatever they want. And then when they go commit, then we'll go check to see whether that was okay or not. Right? So this is assuming that the conflicts are rare, so therefore you're better off just checking at the end whether things are okay, because uh, most of the times it will be okay. Um, not always the case, but that's, that's the general idea behind this. And the way we're going to use to figure out what the serializable ordering is of our transactions is going to be through timestamps. So the, we're going to introduce, introduce this notion of a timestamp we, we assign to transactions. Um, and this is going to be a unique value. Typically, it's well, almost always, it's going to be an integer. Um, whether it's 32 bit or 64 bits, depends on implementation. And transactions will be assigned these timestamps. And that's going to determine their logical ordering uh, for their execution and how they apply changes into the database. Now, this is, this is going to be a sort of tricky concept about this. There's going to be a notion of a logical ordering as defined through the, through the logical ordering of transactions operations as defined through these timestamps. And then there's going to be a physical ordering, like a wall clock ordering. And those, those two aren't always going to match up. But we'll, we'll see examples of what I mean by this as we go along. So, so we have two transactions, T, I, T, J. Each of them are going to be assigned a timestamp. I'm not saying when they'll be assigned this. We'll, we'll, we'll cover that in a second. But we're going to say that if, if the timestamp of TI is less than the timestamp of TJ, then the database system has a guarantee uh, through its time, timestamp ordering protocol that the execution schedule that it's going to produce uh, that for this, the changes they're going to make to the database will be equivalent to one where 
there was a serial ordering of TI followed by TJ. Yes? Why does 2A serial schedule represent 2 the serial schedule? Are there multiple serial schedules? Uh, see, because of a good point, yes, it should be, if you say the, yes. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. It's very precise. I like that. Okay. So this timestamp is, again, it's going to be this monotonically increasing value that we keep assigning to transactions, right? Um, and so, again, we'll see these different protocol schemes. Some of them are, are, are going to give you the timestamp when you start the transaction. Some of the, time, some of the protocols are going to be the timestamp when you finish the transaction. Then we'll talk about multi-version concurrency control next week, and there'll be actually two timestamps, the time you start and the time you commit. And again, we'll, we'll explain what that is next week. Um, so there's a bunch of different ways you can actually implement this. Uh, uh, the most simplest way is probably, well, actually, the logical kind of simplest, but one approach is to use a, the system clock or what I call the wall clock. Like, think of this as, like, physical time. Um, and you typically would use, like, the UTC time zone because you, you want to avoid, uh, avoid, like, daylight savings and all that BS, which comes up this weekend, right? Because you don't want to have, you can't have time steps go back in time, right? You don't want, like, daylight savings hits, and now the time stamps I'm using for my transactions are now an hour in the past, Right? Because now I'll, that's going to break my serial ordering. Um, for logical counters, just think of this as like there's a single counter. You just add one to it every time you, you hand out a, a timestamp. Uh, and then there'll be a hybrid approach, which is more common in distributed systems. We'll cover after Thanksgiving, where you can actually use a combination of the wall clock time and the uh, and a logical counter. And sometimes you can intermix things like with the host IDs and, and IP addresses or something. That way, it's, it's easier to break ties. But again, the key thing is that we can't have timestamps go back, right? Uh, we'll see this when we call it uh, when we cover multi-versioning next week. Postgres actually has a problem because they have wraparound because they only use 32-bit integers for for timestamps uh, for transaction IDs. So, like, at some point, you'll hit the limit and it wraps back around to zero, uh, and then now you have transactions that, that, that like are, are in the future physically, but like logically they look in the past, and Postgres has to deal with that. We'll, we'll talk about how to do that next class. All right, so today we're going to talk about uh, the two main timestamp ordering protocols. Uh, there's the basic timestamp ordering protocol, uh, and then there's optimistic concurrency control. And this is another problem in, in, in databases in this, in this course where there's uh, the naming kind of sucks. So there'll be a basic timestamp ordering protocol, which is, is, is the name of it, but it's in the category of timestamp ordering protocols. Uh, and then there'll be an optimistic concurrency protocol, which is a timestamp ordering protocol, but that, ha that is optimistic. Again, I didn't make these names, but uh, it's, it is what it is. So the basic timestamp ordering protocol is an optimistic protocol. The optimistic concurrency code protocol is a timestamp ordering protocol. Yeah. All right. Buckle up. OK. <laughs> and then we have time, which I, we're probably going to run out of time. Uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll carry over this next class. We'll talk about isolation levels and how, how to handle uh, other anomalies. All right, so the basic timestamp ordering protocol is we're going to allow transactions to read and write objects without locks. Um, and what's going to happen is every object in our database is now going to have two timestamps. There'll be the timestamp of the transaction that last wrote to it and the timestamp of the last transaction that read to it. And that means that anytime you read it, we're going to update this timestamp, and every time you write to it, we have to update the timestamp. And these timestamps and the, and the objects always have to be moving forward in time. Right? And so we just need to make sure that, again, we, we, we don't have you know, weird time travel effects where a transaction in the past updates a, a, an object that was written in the future. Again, I'll, I'll explain what this is. Um, and so and I, and I'm, I'm putting the word future in quotes, again, because this this notion between the logical time and the physical time. Logically, I have to make sure things are happening always in, in increasing order. But physically, I may be allowed to read something uh, write something before something else logically happens. Again, we'll, we'll see examples of this as we go along. All right, so do a read. Uh, well, I was to say, my, my, when my transaction starts, I get a timestamp. Right? It doesn't matter how, whether it's wall clock time or a counter, it doesn't matter. So now when I, when I read an object, uh, if the object I'm trying to read has a write timestamp that is greater than my, my transaction's timestamp, then I know that a transaction in the future logically in the future, has wrote to this object before I was able to read to it. And therefore, that would violate ser serial ordering or serializable ordering. And therefore, I have to ab abort my transaction. Because right? I can't read things with a timestamp in the future. Right? And then when my transaction gets restarted, I'll get assigned a new timestamp. 
right? Because that that'll avoid starvation. That like if I get restarted, I come back, and I can always get a newer timestamp. So at some point, I will have the higher priority. Yes. When you talk about these timestamps, they're like across different transactions, right? Like one transaction might set like the right timestamp, and then the other transaction comes past. Like what? We're not just talking about timestamps from one different transaction. Yeah. So so he's asked, what he's saying is like the and these objects they're gonna have these right timestamps and retimestamps. These could be modified by different transactions running at the same time. Correct. So, so these objects are like, like a, it's a, the global shared database, and I have multiple transactions trying to update at the same time. So the timestamps could come from different transactions. Correct. Yes. Yes. Am I right that we still need to acquire the latch on the data structure in order to get this token? Yes. So he says, and he's correct, that like I'm talking about locks, but in the, you know I'm talking of this this protocol at a high level. When I actually implement it, does that still mean I need to acquire latches on like the pages and anything I update and indexes? Absolutely, yes. Yes. Yeah. So the statement is TS of TI. That's the timestamp to transaction TI that is acquired when it calls begin, but the right timestamp on object X is whatever the timestamp was of the transaction that modified it. Correct. Yes. Uh, no, 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 no. It, it, so, you know what I said about there's two timestamps? That's, that's for MVCC. Ignore that. In, in basic timestamp ordering protocol, every transaction has one timestamp that it's given when it starts. One and only one. All right, so if we don't, if this conditional holds true, then we're, TI is allowed to read X, and then we're going to update the read timestamp of this object to be either the, the what the current, the, the max of we, the current timestamp is, or our read time, or our timestamp, right? Because again, we want to make sure that we keep track of like, here's the last timestamp of an object that read this tuple, but we don't want to have that go back in time. It's always got to go forward. So that's what we take the max. If we want to ensure repeatable reads, this is not required by the basic TO protocol, but this is something actually you could do, and it'll start looking like OCC, which we'll talk about next. Um, if we want to ensure that if we go read the same object again, we get the same value then we can make a local copy in a private workspace of the value of x in, in, uh, in TI, right? And this is, this, this is a shortcut things to make sure that like, if we go back and read it again, but someone wrote to it, we don't, we don't end up aborting. Yes? In other work situations, will the, like, the timestamp of TI be larger than RTS? Under what condition would the timestamp of TI be larger than the uh, RTS? RTS? I have... Uh, so transaction one, transaction two, say one and two are their timestamps. I, transaction two starts, uh, it reads A, updates the read timestamp to two. Transaction T, T1 starts, they read the same object, but the read timestamp is two. That's okay, right? Because I'll, I'm only checking whether someone wrote to it. I don't care if you read it and I wrote it and you're, you're in the future. It doesn't matter. That's okay. Yes. All right, so, so his statement is, why do, I, why do I have to do this? You don't. I'm saying this is an optimization you can do. Right? If you don't want to have to abort because you would violate this, then you can make a local copy. But shouldn't you abort? Like, if somebody violates it, so you're like... So he says, shouldn't you abort? We'll get to this in a second. Yeah. Like, does it matter? It might not. All right, to do writes, uh, the check, the, the variant check is, 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 is a disjunction or or between... Either my timestamp is, is less than the read timestamp of the object we're trying to write to. Again, that means that someone in the future has read the object that I'm trying to write to. And therefore, if I was going in serial ordering, they would have saw my write, but they didn't. Or if, someone, if my timestamp is less than the write timestamp, again, that means someone in the future wrote to this object I'm trying to write to, and I'm trying to now overwrite their, their change. So if either of those conditions, uh, uh, if we don't satisfy either of those conditions, then we have to abort and restart. Otherwise, we're allowed to write to the object, and then we update the write timestamp. And again, we can make a local copy if you want to ensure repeatable reads. Yes? So does this like, enforce a much stricter serialization than even proof of So the statement is, doesn't this, doesn't this enforce a more stricter uh, ser serializable ordering? Or it, does it have a, a fewer opportunities for parallelism than two-phase locking? Yeah. Yes. But it's, again, it's correct. 
That we care about that first. Yes. When you set like the timestamp for like uh, bringing in an object, do you set it to the timestamp of the transaction, or do you set it to like an updated time, given that some time has passed since the transaction was updated? So his question, his question is, uh, when I read or write an object, what timestamp am I giving it? You have to give it what, what the, the timestamp of the transaction, right. not something else in the future, because then, because you don't know what that is, right? All right, let's let's walk through an example. All right, so T1 is going to read read B, read A, and then read read B, read A, and then read A again. T2 is going to read B, write B, read A, write A. Right. So T1 starts again when when a transaction starts, we're assigned a timestamp. So for simplicity, we say T, T1 has the timestamp of T1. So now it's going to do a read on B, and so we're going to go look now in the database, look in the, the read timestamp column. I mean, it would be stored in the header of the tuple, right? Uh, but you can think of it like a virtual column. The timestamp, uh, the, read, the read timestamp is zero. Therefore, we're allowed to read it. Uh, well, we also check the write timestamp. The write timestamp is less than us, so we're, we're, that's okay. So we read on the object, update the read timestamp, and that's fine. Now T2 starts, because this is a context switch. It gets timestamp two. Uh, it does a read on B. Uh, and again, we just go check that the write timestamp is less than our timestamp, uh, it is, so zero is less than two. So we're allowed to read it, and then we update the read timestamp to two. Then we do the, uh, the write on B. In this case here, we check the write timestamp and the read timestamp. They're both either less than or greater than to our timestamp, two. So we're allowed to write the object, and then we update the write timestamp to two. Then we go back to, t to T1. Uh, he does a, they do a read on A. And again, the read timestamp of A is, is less than, uh, or the write timestamp is less than our read timestamp, so we can update the read timestamp to one, that's fine. Now we do a read on A here, same thing. Uh, the write timestamp is less than our timestamp, so we update the read timestamp on A to two. Then we come back here now, we do a read on A, and in this case here, we, the, we're allowed to read the object because the write timestamp is less than, than our timestamp. But here now the, um, the, the read timestamp on the object A is greater than the our timestamp, so therefore we don't want to update it. We just, we leave it alone. Right now we do the write on A again. Check check the write timestamp, the read timestamp. They're both le less than or equal to two, so that's fine. We go ahead and do the write, and then now we're safe for us to commit because there's no violations. Yes. If you switch the read A and write A to order on the top two, then it would like T one will. Yeah, so his statement is, if I switch this read A and write A, this happened before this one, this transaction would write A, that would update the write timestamp to the object to two. This guy then tries to read A, sees that the write timestamp is greater than his timestamp, uh, which is one, so therefore he can't read in the future, he'd have to abort. Uh, so his statement is, isn't this equivalent to just taking a global lock on the entire database and, and just do serial execution? Um, well, no, because if, if, if T1 only reads A and T2 reads, reads only B, reads writes only B, then there's no, there's no conflicts and I can interleave them. Oh, okay. Yeah. But in principle, it kind of has the same behavior, kind of. Uh, what do you mean in principle? Like if you take a global lock on the database, it will exert the exact same behavior as this if you don't... Uh, if you're reading the same object, sure, yeah. But like two-phase locking, we do that too. Yeah. There's no, like, if, if I have one tube on my database and I have a million threads trying to update one thing, yeah, global lock is, is the same thing as a global lock. Right. Yes? Can you clarify how this is optimistic? So his statement is, how, how, how is this optimistic? Because I don't require locks, uh, and I... I don't require locks. I, yeah, so it's, he's sort of right. The, if you squint, if I go check the, if I go check the read, rewrite timestamps, th that's equivalent to trying to acquire the lock and then like killing myself if I can't acquire it. So yeah, sort of, yes. So it's, uh, it's optimistic in that you're not acquiring, you're not acquiring locks. Yes. Okay, you just not need a lock and this, and this his statement is you don't need, a, do, do I not need a lock measure? That is correct. 
because the global state of what wrote and what, who read and wrote to what is in the database itself. Yes? So would we abort a transaction we have to roll back everything that has been written uh, by it before? So the statement is, in this case here, if I, if I have to abort, would I have to roll back everything I wrote? Yes. Locks or latches? It would be latches. You're right, because you, you'd protect the table, you protect the pages or whatever it is that you're that you're that you're rolling back. Yes. Yes. This seems to be favoring uh, later transactions, like transactions that are shorter time sensitive. It's always earlier uh, transactions that are Yeah, so his his statement is, and he's correct, this protocol favors the newer transactions because it's the older transactions, if they, they're the ones that would violate the invariance we check. And therefore, if someone's in the future is over, over, overwriting them, then they have to kill themselves. Correct, yes. We'll see OCC, we can actually, do, we can actually go both directions. If yes. If you abort, do you need to change the timestamps and revisions? Yeah, so the statement is, if I, if I abort, do I need to roll back the writes and roll back the timestamps? Yes. How do you roll back the timestamps? Yeah, so like, yeah, so, so this protocol, like, this is really simplistic view of this. Just, uh, the timestamp ordering is what I want to focus on. In practice, you're absolutely right. You'd have to maintain the rewrite sets and know who read what, what keep track of all those dependencies, and then roll back appropriately. Yes. All right, so let's look on where, where we do aborts. Um, so in this case here, T1 is going to do a read on A, a write on A, and then a read on A. T2 is just going to write on A. This is called, in databases, it's called a blind write, meaning like I write to an object without reading it first. Um, it does occur, it's, 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 it's not super common, but it, there are situations where people do this. Um, all right, so uh, T1 starts, it gets, so it has, assuming it has the timestamp of T1. So it does a read on A, uh, it's allowed to do that, updates the read timestamp. Now T2 does a write on A, it's allowed to do that because the read timestamp is less than two, and the write timestamp is, is also less than two. So we do an update on A and update the write timestamp. Now this guy wakes up again, he does a write on A, but now it would be a violation of, of the right timestamp because T1's timestamp is one, and that's less than two. And so someone in the future has written to this object before we could, and therefore we have to abort and roll back, right? So one thing to point out though, does it actually matter, right? So again, the serial order should be T1 followed by T2. So T2 did the last write on A. So does the world really need to know that like what this write actually was? No, right? We could just we could just ignore it, and, and that would still be correct. So this is an optimization called the Thomas Wright rule. And the basic idea is that uh, if I try to write to something uh, and someone has read it in the future, I can't allow that. But if I try to write something and somebody else wrote it to in the future, then I can just ignore my write because nobody would have saw it anyway, right? And I allow the transaction that tried to do that right, that would have had a conflict, let it keep on running uh, without aborting. So now this violates the timestamp ordering protocol that, or the, the timestamp protocol that we, that we specified, um, but it's okay, right? Because no one ever saw the right, everyone, no one ever saw T1's right, they saw T2's right. Um, so this, this right rule, so this, this is in the literature. I think it came out in like, like 1970 or some, 79 or something. Um, and I was looking at the guy that, that invented this. There's, there's a guy named Robert Thomas, Robert H. Thomas. Um, and I, there's no, like he was at this, this think tank in, in, in Cambridge near MIT called BBN. who did a lot of early work on the databases in like the 80s and 70s. Uh, I was trying to figure out whether he was dead. I can't figure out. I can't figure that out. But then it turns out this guy is also this Robert Thomas guy who invented this right rule. He actually invented the first malware in 1970, like the first like worm called Creeper. Uh, and what's interesting about it is like all the security literature and, and like about malware, they refer to him as Bob Thomas, but in all his database papers, he's Robert Thomas. As far as I can tell, it's the same dude, right? Bob H. Thomas is, is very, very likely to be Robert H. Thomas to be at BBN in the 1970s, 1980s, right? So the guy that invented this rule invented the first uh, computer virus, one of the first ones. All right, so let's see how we do the Thomas Wright rule. So now do read on A, that's allowed. Do write on A, that's allowed. Now I do the write on A here. Again, the timestamp of, of T1 is less than t the write timestamp of this object. So normally we'd, we'd have to abort, 
But we just say, all right, well, let's just ignore that, right? T, T, T2 T is already committed. That's fine. All right, we already told the outside world that T2 is committed. So we just ignore that. Let, uh, let T1 read its own write, all right? And we, we don't update the timestamp. And that's still OK. Yes? Uh, well, her statement is, would that lead to a cascading abort in, in this example here? Uh, no. It's, it's T1 is reading a value that is not seeing. So her statement is, T1 is seeing a value that, that it should not see. Uh, at this point up here, down below, it's going to so it's gonna, it's gonna read its own write. Yeah. How do you make this happen? How do you make what happen? Uh, we'll see this in OCC, but multi-version can do this too. Yes, because you know your timestamp, you know what your timestamp is, so you want to see the version of the object at your timestamp, or you have a private workspace as an OCC. Yes. Wait, so basically, we create this elite into T1 that you wrote to A by actually. Yes. So the statement is: we create the illusion that T1 actually wrote to A, even though it didn't happen. Yes. And then basically that means just locking T2 all the way down, like that, to write A to in T2 down to create a zero write. Uh, so say if it's swapping what? Sorry. Like that's basically like, it's the same as uh, just moving T2 all the way down and then let T1 come in and then let T2 write. Uh, so you're saying logically this is equivalent to letting T1 do its thing. And then followed by T2? Yeah. Yes. Oh. Yeah. That's, the, that's, that's serializable ordering, yes. You had a question? Sorry, yes. Um, the, the like database thing on the right, is it building some kind of slash on that? On the right? Yes, again, everyone. Like you, <laughs> this is PowerPoint. I'm showing you like, you know, mm -hmm. simple diagrams. In the actual implementation, you still have to protect your, your data structures with latches. All the things we talked about up, up until now. Absolutely, yes. This is, a, this is a higher level logical thing, assuming you have the lower level physical latching implementations in place. Yes? For this, even if you feel like it's promised to write, what if you still abort on the read right after? So the statement is, in the, on the Thomas Wright thing, would I still abort when I do the read here in T1? Again, if I have a private workspace, I would put my write of T1 into something that T1, sorry, put the write to A into something T1 can only see. Then when T1 does the read, it says, oh, okay, it's in my private workspace. It doesn't actually go to the global database. This is what OCC does. We'll see this in a second. Yes. OK. Um, so again, we, the basic t t uh, time step only protocol will guarantee that we'll, we'll, we'll generate a schedule that's conflict serializable. If you do not use the Thomas Wright rule, if you use the Thomas Wright rule, you may end up in view serializable land. Uh, but in general, there'll be no deadlocks because no, no transaction ever has to wait. Um, but we could have the problem that someone brought up before where if I have a really long transaction that does a lot of updates and a bunch of other small transactions that are really short come and keep updating the things that I'm trying to read or write, uh, since, since my transaction is really long, I'm going to have a really old timestamp. It's, it's, it's getting older and older over time. And therefore, the, the youth is going to keep coming in my house and killing my transaction, right? Like, so th this is unavoidable in this protocol. So I will say also, too, that this is an older protocol. Go back to late 1970s, early, early 1980s. I'm not aware of anybody, any other, any system out there that actually implements exactly what I'm describing here today. Uh, and therefore, I don't know if anybody actually does the Thomas Wright rule, um, it, but it's in the literature. It shows up a lot. Um, but I would say the reason why I'm showing you this is because it's going to give us the building blocks to OCC and multi-versioning. So if you understand this, you can understand how we're actually going to do uh, ordering of transactions and reads and writes in, in OCC and multi-versioning. So, Part of the reason why nobody implements this is that it's really inefficient. Because uh, now every single time I read a, a tuple, I actually got to write to the tuple, potentially, because I have to update the, the, the timestamp. And I need to persist that, that, that timestamp on disk. Because right? if I crash and come back, I want to know, you know what, what the read timestamps were. Um, how is that true? No, you could. You, if you crash and come back, you could potentially reset it to zero because there are no transactions active. You would roll back everything. Uh, but it may be the case that a transaction updates uh, some pages, then you run out of memory, and it has to flush those pages out the disk to make room in your buffer pool, and you may have to bring them back in later. So in that case, you would have to write the timestamps out. But again, this basically means that every read becomes a write, and that's terrible for performance. Yes? Doesn't the, the two-space locking suffer the same thing? 
problem? Statement is, doesn't two-phase lock locking suffer the same problem? Uh, I, don't, I don't write the lock manager contents at the disk. But if I, if I update a page, we'll see this when we talk about logging recovery. If I update a page and my transaction has committed yet, I gotta, and, and I need to swap it out, I got to write the dirty page at the disk. Yes. But like in two-phase locking, I could read a, a billion tuples and, yes, bring them into memory. But when I run out of space and need to evict them, I, don't, I didn't update any, any timestamps as you do in basic timestamp ordering. So I just, I just, when I evict them, I just drop the, drop the frames. So in that regard, it's more efficient. And as I said, also, too, the other problem with this basic protocol is that the, the longer running timestamps get starved out. Because right? the likelihood of something, some other transaction is going to read something uh, in the future before the, the long running transaction gets to it uh, increases over time. So your statement, your question is, you can, you can or cannot. He said, statement is, you cannot evict dirty pages before a transaction is about to commit. Yes, yes you can. We'll get to that. Right. Yes. T give me two weeks. Yeah. Not, not all systems do that. Most of them do, right? We'll, we'll talk about stealing and in, in, uh, in the buffer pool in a second or in two weeks. And this is why, again, I, I wanted to teach you the basics of a buffer pool. So when we go back and talk about transactions and talk about now doing recovery, like, you, know, it's, it's, you understand how the buffer pool works, and now you see uh, you know, how we extend the protocols to do eviction to, to account for dirty rights from transactions that are still active. OK, so if we assume transactions or conflicts between transactions are going to be rare, and that most of the transactions are going to be short-lived, um, then using locks and using these timestamps, updating timestamps over and over again, uh, is going to add this unnecessary overhead. So a better approach could potentially then to build a Kikuchio protocol that we optimize for the, the, the use case where most transactions are not going to conflict, and most of them are going to be quite small. And in practice, uh, most transactions are short in, in most systems, in most applications. Uh, yes, you have bulk updates where like, people load a bunch of stuff once a week, once a day. But like, just think about like, when you go load a, a web page, you know, it's not it's not doing a lot of writes uh, on, on a bunch of different objects. It's doing the writes on just your stuff. So conflicts are, are going to be uh, conflicts are potentially uh, are, are more rare in, in most cases. So this is what OCC is going to do for us, um, and it's going to be an extension of the the basic timestamp ordering protocol that we talked about. Uh, but instead of having this optional private workspace where I said we could put our writes into that, so that when we read them again, we go to the private workspace. In OCC, you explicitly have to have this. So anytime I'm going to read an object or write to an object, I'm not going to do anything in the, in the global database. I'm going to have this private workspace that's, that's specific to my transaction. And I put my copy of the read there, and I put all my writes in there. And then when it, now a transaction goes to commit, you go look what's in your private workspace, and you go look at what other transactions are running, running at the same time, or either in the future or in the past. We'll, we'll explain both ways. Uh, and you go to see whether the things you're the changes you're trying to make to from your private workspace into the global database, you see whether there's any, any conflicts. And if yes, then, then you have to board. If no, then you're allowed to apply your changes to the global database, and everyone, everyone can now see, see your changes, right? So 2PL was invented in uh, I think 1976 at IBM. Uh, OCC was invented in 1981, actually here at CMU uh, by H.T. Kung. Um, and he was not a database professor. He was a networking person. Of course, like, what's the point of having a network if you can't connect to a database, right? Um, so uh, he, you know, he was like, you know, an old school systems guy. Uh, he's not here anymore. I think he's still alive. Uh, that's not a joke. Was, yeah, I bet he's a really nice guy. Um, so he got hired by Harvard in, in the 90s because uh, the Harvard CS department was a train wreck. Um, and they hired him to, to like, fix it. Uh, <laughs> No, no, I should no, 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 no. I interviewed there. I, they were very nice people, but CMU is better. CMU, is, CMU, is CMU, right? Like, um, no, the, 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 my wife wanted to stay in New England. Uh, I got the offer to CMU, and so in, in exchange for not staying in New England, uh, she moved to Pittsburgh with me. Uh, she was my girlfriend at the time, um, and she got a puppy. Yeah, so that's that, that was the deal we worked out. Um, so, uh, what point was I going to make about this? Uh, no, so, so the, in my opinion, the, there's this guy at MSR named Phil Bernstein. Uh, he's fantastic. He's probably the world premier expert in, in concurrency control and transactions, right? 
uh, like a lot of the stuff I'm teaching you here is from like seminal papers he wrote in like the early 1980s. He built one of the first distributed databases in like 1970s. Like this guy is pure genius uh, when it comes to databases. And he got denied tenure from Harvard because it was like early CS and they, they applied all the rules, like Harvard applied all the rules for giving tenure that they would give for like biology and all their sort of traditional sciences. But in like computer science, we don't write journal papers, we write, uh, we write conference papers. They so crank out things more quickly. So they were like, what is this database stuff? What is this transaction stuff? And to me, it's a groundbreaking seminal work. And the Harvard CS department was like, I don't know what this is. And they denied him tenure. So they hired H.T. Kung. They stole him from us to go fix, fix their department. We'll cut that out of the video. <laughs> OK. Well, anyway, I met him when I interviewed there. He was super, super nice. I, he was a really nice guy. Um, all right, so OCC is going to have three phases. And again, there's another one. The naming is going to suck, OK? So bear with me here. This is, this is what HT, this is what the original paper talks about. So there's going to be a read phase for a transaction where the transaction is actually going to do reads and writes. Um, but it's going to apply those, the, it's going to copy all the things it reads and all, all it writes into its private workspace. And just think of this as like some chunk of memory or some, some can be backed by the buffer pool or it doesn't have to be. But like it's, it's, it's specific to this transaction. No other transaction can read in that private workspace. Uh, at, uh, while transactions running. Then we have the validation phase. And this is where the transaction says, I want to commit. So, you, so as soon as you call commit, you, you automatically enter the validation phase. Uh, you now get a timestamp. And you see whether your transaction has made changes that conflict with other transactions, either in the future or the past. You only go in one direction. But we'll talk about both of them. And then the right phase, uh, if your validation succeeds, then you're allowed to apply your private changes to the, to the global database. Otherwise, your transaction will abort and have to restart. All right, so let's look at an example here. So first thing to point out is we're getting rid of the read timestamp in the database. Now we only have the write timestamp, right? Because we all, all we care about is what is the last transaction, what's the timestamp of the last transaction that wrote to this? And then now here also I'm showing in the schedule we have these, these regions for the, for the three phases, read, validate, and write. And again, this is not something you explicitly would call in SQL. Underneath the covers, there's the, the system is doing its own bookkeeping to tell you what, what phase you're in. And I'm showing the commit down here outside of this. But it's, it's basically the transaction would say, I want to commit, automatically enter the validate phase. But then sort of logically, uh, the changes are not applied. And the, you don't tell the outside world you commit until you complete the, the last two phases. All right, so T1 starts, uh, begins with, with the read phase. Uh, as soon as I call begin. Uh, and then we set up our private workspace. And it's going to have the same thing that we read in the global workspace. The object, in this case here, I'm showing the value. So think of it as a key value pair. And then the write timestamp. So now when the transaction wants to do a read on A. Uh, I copy the, whatever the current, uh, current uh, I don't want to say version, the current state of, of, of object A into my private workspace uh, along with the, the, whatever the, the, the write timestamp was. Now I switch over here, T, T2 starts, same thing. It's in the read phase, create a private workspace. It does a read on A. It also then gets a copy of the same object. All right, so in this case here, we have the global database, and then each transaction has a copy of A in, in its private workspace. So then now uh, T2 goes to commit. And so now we enter the validate phase. So this is when we actually get a timestamp in OCC. Again, basic timestamp ordering protocol, you got it when you call begin. In this, in this world, you don't have a timestamp until, until you enter, until you call commit, until you try to validate. So in this case here, for, uh, for T2, we would look to see, did we write anything uh, in our workspace that we need to apply to the database? In this case, it's, it's a read-only transaction. Uh, so, so we're fine there. And our, the, time, the right timestamp of, of, of object A in our private workspace matches the one in the global database. Uh, so we're allowed to automatically enter the, the, the write phase. There's nothing to write back. Our transaction allowed to commit, and we're done. And we, and we blow away the private workspace. T1 would start. It does a write on A. Uh, and again, at this point here, we don't have a timestamp yet. So when we update the object on our private workspace, we set our write timestamp to infinity. Like it's a, something in the future. We don't know what it's going to be yet. And then now when I go to validate, I have to go check to see whether uh, is there any other transaction that wrote, read or wrote to the thing that I wrote to that has, would have a less a smaller timestamp than I do, or, 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 or it's in the future? In this case here, we get timestamp 2. 
uh, when we apply our change, we update the timestamp in the global database, right? And then at that point, we're done and we've committed. All right, so let's go through the, the three phases. Um, the validate phase is, is the more, more tricky one. So read phase, is, as I already said, we just track the read-write sets of transactions in a private workspace. Um, and every time I read them, uh, I always go, every time I, if I read the same object or same, same record again, I look at my private workspace first to see, see what is there. So for this, I'm ignoring how we handle indexes. Right? I'm actually ignoring how we actually would implement this. Because you think about it, like I would do a lookup on an object. I, typically, I want to go through an index and find it. I need to, you know, how, how would I actually do this if I, you know, if I have a private workspace? Because I can't, I don't want to update the index to point to my private workspace because I don't want other people to see this. So for now, we, we can ignore how we actually do this. Yes. Yes, the question is, in this case here, when I do the write on A, I don't, I don't have a timestamp yet. So when I, my private workspace, I set the right timestamp to infinity. Then when I go to validate, I now get a, a, right time, I get a timestamp. Uh, so I want to check to see, the question, do I write to this and then check? I mean, it doesn't, it doesn't matter. When you check, you use timestamp two. Yeah, when I check, it's not infinity. It's, I'm checking whether, whether two is, is less than the right timestamp of uh, the, of the transaction up there, of the, sorry, of the, in the global state. It's actually more complicated because you have to go maybe check the private workspace of other transactions. We'll get that in a second, yes. So in this case, if T1 and T2 got the opposite timestamps, T2 crash because, uh, the T2 abort because um, it's trying to read a value that's in between two right here? So his question is, if, if T1, T2 got timestamp two, uh, that means it would happen down here, uh, would it crash? Uh, if, if, if you're doing forward validation, meaning you're looking at transactions in the future to see whether you conflict with them, T1 would actually, the first guy would actually abort. If you're doing backwards validation, this guy would abort because someone wrote to something in the past that you missed. We'll get, get to that. Now. We'll just, just get to that now. Okay. All right. So again, when T1 commits, uh, invokes commit, then we enter the validation phase, and we have to check whether we have conflicts with other transactions. Uh, and again, we want to guarantee that, we, that the, the, the schedule we, we produce is equivalent to one that, that has a serial ordering. So we're going to look for read-write and write-write conflicts with other, other transactions. And we're going to make sure that our conflicts, if we abort a transaction, are always going to go in, in one direction. There's a reoccurring theme we see throughout, throughout the databases uh, to avoid deadlocks, avoid issues, or in incorrectness problems. If everybody goes, always checks things sort of the same direction, then we can guarantee that we'll, we'll end up with a serial ordering. We saw the same thing with like wound and wait versus wait and die. So the two approaches do backward validation and forward validation. So with backward validation, the idea is that we're going to check to see whether there was other transactions that had, that wrote to something or read something or wrote to something that in the past that we we missed when, when we actually do a read or a write. So say we want, we want to commit transaction two at this point here. So we don't care about transaction three because they're still running. They haven't applied any changes yet. So we don't care if we miss them, right? We care about going backwards in time. So we would look at what are the objects that we read and wrote, check to see whether the, if we read to it, whether the, the right timestamp has changed, meaning a transaction in the past wrote to an object that we should have saw if we were running in, in serial order. And if we didn't see that right, then we, we kill ourselves, right? If, it, if it's a right-right conflict, that's OK, because we, we would just overwrite what, what they've done. So we call this sort of the validation scope. This is checking to see whether something in the past, there, was there a logical right in the past that we missed when, 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 when we read that object? Forward validation is going the other direction. So this one is uh, T2 is trying to commit here. I don't care about anything in the past, right? Because if this guy wrote to something that I wrote, sorry, this guy wrote to something that I didn't read, then they would have killed themselves. 
because right? I'm always going in one direction. So this guy only cares about what else is running at me at the same time I am, and did I write to something that they didn't read yet? Now they may read that object in the future after I've, I've committed, but that's okay because my changes would have been applied to the global database, and therefore they, they would have saw it. So let's focus on, on, the, on the forward validation. Uh, again, we, we can go to details of both of them, but they essentially work the same way. If you understand one, you understand the other. So again, every transaction gets a timestamp at the beginning of the validation phase, and then we're going to check the timestamp uh, with all other committing transactions. Of, uh, that, uh, sorry, for the committing transaction, check with all other running transactions at the same time, and you're basically going to peek in their private workspace and say, okay, what, what did they read? And, and then, therefore, did, did they miss something that I wrote? So we're going to allow, uh, we're going to allow the, our transaction to commit. Uh, so if we allow a transaction to commit, then all the three, three conditions must hold. So the first one's sort of obvious. It basically says that if TI completes all the phases before TJ even begins execution, then, then there's, there could, never possibly could be a conflict, right? Because I ran, I committed, and then you show up a day later, you know, of course you're going to see my change. We, we, weren't, we weren't running at the same time. So that one's pretty obvious. And I'm, I'm only showing two transactions here, but like, you can imagine a real system, you would have maybe hundreds of thousands of transactions. Um, and this is obviously easier than checking the rewrite sets because the time set, you know, you haven't started yet, so that's easy. All right, the next validation step is that TI is going to complete before TJ starts its write phase, and TI did not write to any object that was read by TJ. And this is basically saying my write set has no intersection, or uh, the, the intersection of my write set with the other transaction's read set is an empty set. So meaning I, didn't, I did not write anything that, that they wrote. Sorry, I did not write anything that they read. They read. So visually looks like this, right? So here we do the validation phase, uh, and T1 already read A, wrote to A, uh, and so in this case here, because T2 uh, read to A, it has the the right timestamp of zero in its private workspace. T1 has to peek in the private workspace, say, okay, you read this, but I wrote to it as well. My timestamp is infinity. Uh, I'm way in the future. You should have read that, and you didn't. So therefore, uh, I have to kill myself because if you go then commit, you would have you would have committed without seeing my write. Yes. Then it can't just check the database. You have to check the other people's workspace. So the statement is for this one, you can't check the database. You have to check the other workspaces. Yes. But then, so you need to have you need to know what exactly are the current workspaces that are currently like. So the statement is like. Uh, the system needs to know where, what, what are the other private workspaces that are available. Yeah. yeah. What's wrong with that? Oh. Then if there's multiple threads, you can check through all of them. Is, is there, if there's multiple threads, we check with all of them. Yeah. But it's our database. We can do whatever we want, right? Like, is it is it the most efficient way to do this? Maybe. Maybe not. Depends on where the transactions are running. If they're if they're on another machine, yeah, you, that's a problem, right? If they're in the same box, it might be okay. Yes. Yeah, so his, his, he brings, the point he brings up is that these validation checks are not atomic, meaning I'm not pausing the other threads while I do the checks. Therefore, if it's, it takes a long time to go through 100 private workspaces, uh, like, could that be a problem? Because, because by the time I could then go commit, uh, someone else read something that, that didn't apply to the global workspace. Yes. So, so again, for simplicity, assume that it's, it's serial valid validation, which is not, not the most efficient, but for simplicity, that's the way to do it. The way to handle that is you, you, you could hold the latch on the page you're going to update in the global, global database while you then go check. Then nobody can come read, read, read it. Well, again, that's, I'm trying to get through this logically, but physically that's the way you would do it. All right, uh, another example here. All right, so T1 is going to read on, read on A, write on A. T2 writes on, reads on A. So I do my validation step here. Uh, 
it's safe to commit T2 uh, because logically, uh, sorry, because T2 will commit logically before T1. So T2 called validate, it got a timestamp, it said, oh, I, I, there wasn't anything in the global database that I missed, uh, and there wasn't anything in a private workspace that I missed, um, th that I didn't read, so therefore I get my timestamp here, then there's a context switch, T1 starts running, it gets a timestamp that's in the, in the future of T, T2, and therefore uh, T2, T2's rights would not have been read by, by T1, T, T, T1's rights would not have been read by T2's re, read, uh, so therefore that's, that's allowed, they're allowed to commit. Okay, so the last step is the, we just checked that the, the read set of my transaction doesn't intersect with the reset. My write set doesn't intersect with your read set, and my write set doesn't intersect with your, with your write set. All right, so going to the example here. Right, we do a validate, we get uh, timestamp T1. It's safe to commit because T2 will see the, the database after B has, T1 has committed. So it'll see the write that T1 makes to A, then when, when this guy then reads it, th they will get it. Because we, we apply the change, update the, the, the write timestamp, we go away, then we validate, or then we do the read in T2, it would then see that change. All right, so the last one is to do the write phase. Uh, again, this, we're, we're just propagating the changes we made from the, the private workspace into the global database, ignoring how we handle indexes for now. Um, so sort of the question he brought up about like, oh, is this really, how do you prevent this, this race condition? You can, so for simplicity, you just do, do serial commits where there's only one transaction that can be in the validation and write phase at any given time. If you want to do parallel commits, uh, you can more, use more fine-grained latches to protect the data structures. And the way you avoid deadlocks is that you, you acquire the latches for the things you're going to update in the, in the global database in primary key order. And that guarantees that all threads are acquiring keys in, or latches in the same direction, and you don't have a deadlock because I hold, I, hold, I hold the latch on key two, you hold the latch on key one, and we try to get, get, latches, in, uh, get latches and have a deadlock. If everyone goes in the same, swims in the same direction, you, you don't have this problem. Yes? Even though you hold a global, a, a single validation slash write uh, slash, would, wouldn't it still have the problem that he mentioned? Like the other transactions are in the read phase, so they can read. So, so, so his statement is, would, would, would you still have, like if you hold a, a global latch for the, the validation of write phase, would you still have the problem he's, he mentioned? Yeah. Yes, so that's why you acquired latches on the pages for the tuples are. Okay, so OCC is great when the number of conflicts is low, right? Uh, it's even better when, when most of the transactions are, are read-only, right? Uh, if the database is large and the workload is, is not skewed uh, and there's low probability of, of conflicts, this is going to be preferable over locking because, uh, yes, I may have to copy, make copy things in my private workspace. We, we can talk about next class how to do that more efficiently. Um, but you know, I'm not going into a global lock lock manager to acquire locks and things. Uh, you know, I, just, I just I can read along, and I'm assuming everything's okay. And the validation step will be uh, fairly straightforward. The overhead is going to be though is copying data locally, um, and we'll see multi-versioning is going to have the same problem. Uh, yes, that, that's sort of unavoidable. We talked about the validation step and the right the right phases. The, those bottlenecks you have to acquire latches to make sure those things happen in the quiet order. Um, and one big problem though under OCC though is that the 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 abort uh, aborting transactions could potentially be more wasteful than two phase locking because I'm not I won't know until I until I actually go to the validation phase whether I'm going to abort. So I could do a billion updates only to find out when I go to validate that the first tuple I updated has a conflict and I have to roll back all my changes. Uh, you wouldn't you potentially would not you would not have that in in two phase locking. Although of course in two phase locking you could have deadlocks and you, and you roll back changes. So there's no free launch in databases. I'm not saying OCC better is better than 2PL. Uh, it's you know there, there's, there's trade offs for, for both of these. Yes. In reality, is forward validation used less often than two phase? Is this question is in reality is forward validation used used uh, more than backwards validation? Um, 
Actually, I don't know the answer to that. I have to go. I I I, I have to go look to see what systems. I, so most systems are going to do two PL with multi versioning, which we'll cover next class. Uh, I have to go look to see what, which ones actually support uh, OCC. All right, we only have four minutes left, so I'm going to do a, a, a teaser. I'm going to show a problem, not tell you how to solve it, and we'll, we'll solve it next time. Okay? So, so far, although you have the slides, so you can look ahead. Uh, so, everything we talked about so far has assuming we're dealing with fixed size databases. Like all we're doing is reading and writing objects, right? Uh, or just, you know, just updating existing ones. But now, if there's transactions that want to do insertions, updates, and deletes, sorry, insertions and deletes, now the number of tuples we could have in our tables. Is could be could change, and this this exposes a bunch of new problems or new new type of problem that we haven't talked about so far. All right, so this is called the phantom problem or the, the phantom anomaly. Remember, I said there was uh, sort of the three basic anomalies: dirty reads or unrepeatable reads uh, and and lost updates. There's, this is the fourth one. Uh, there's actually a fifth one we'll talk about next week as well called right skew. But so say I have now two transactions: t1, t2, and instead of showing reads and writes, now I'm going to show SQL statements because because now we, we, you know, we can talk about the reading data that doesn't actually exist. So we have two transactions. The first guy wants to do uh, get the, the, the oldest person that's in this people database or people table where the status is lit. And at the same time, there's another transaction that's going to want to insert to that people table where the status is lit. So when I run T1 first, uh, we find somebody who's 72, who's, who's still lit. Good for them. Um, then there's a context switch. T2 starts running. And what do they do? Well, they insert. Uh, into the people table with someone who has the age of 96, the status of lit. So now when I run uh, when I run T1 again, or go back to T1, and now I run this select query again, now I get 96. Right? So you may think, oh, this is like an unrepeatable read. Unrepeatable read is like at the, like the lowest level that I'm doing like on a single object. So in this case, before, not, there, there wasn't a record 96. There wasn't a, a person that had, was age 96. So like, I simply didn't see it. So two-phase locking is not going to help me here, because how do I lock something that didn't exist? And how would, uh, would timestamp ordering help me? Because you know, like, like there aren't timestamps to even check at this point here. Yes? Um, but in this particular case, since we're doing max like, why wouldn't we apply like, a shared lock on top of the table? All right, so the statement is, in this case here, why would I acquire a share lock on the table to avoid this problem? Uh, yes, that, that, would, that would solve that problem, yes. But assume you didn't do that. So assume, you, assume, you're doing, uh, assume you're doing like tuple level locks. Yes? Wait, but like, I don't see the difference between this and what if we just modify uh, 76 from 96. Like, like, both are essentially just reading. Like All right, so change. change Change max to count. Oh. Then, then, you, then you, get, you get different values. Sure. But two phase locking, if we go from the higher to the lower lock, like you said, the process. Yeah, if, if I lock the entire table, yes, I don't have this problem. But then it's like, then it's basically almost serial ordering. Oh. Wait, there's a way to do this? Without? Yes. Oh. I mean, <laughs> what's the point of this class, right? It was like, yeah. Yeah. we can do anything databases. Yeah. Well, within reason, All right. All right. All right. So, the the reason why this happens is because uh, if you know if we're doing two-phase locking, we can only lock things that that exist. I understand you can take higher level hierarchical lock, locks. Uh, that is going to be one of the solutions we we can, we'll use. Uh, but you know the the notion of complex serializability that we talked about so far really only you know so far we only talked about things that like that have to exist when I start running. If it doesn't exist, then I have this problem. It's called, called phantoms. So next class will be how we actually solve this. And then we'll talk about multi-versioning, multi which I've been alluding to for, for weeks now. We'll finally get to it. OK? All right, guys. Uh, have a good weekend. See you, see you next time. Day cold, taking its toll. I got a
pack of zigzags, but ain't got nothing to roll. Hit the bus spot, let me cop a duck, show some love. Three for 50, is you with me? What I'm speaking of? I'm in the studio at nine, so it's song. And I'm not leaving till I'm finished with my next song. Fucking with that dope, you know it make my legs flow. Just grab a double deuce or two and then I'm good to go. Yo, I get this shit done and get it over with. Cause the whole world's waiting for another Tears Town Street sound. Clown a motherfucker if you label me a fake. I'm like a cobra and I'm down with the super snake. 